everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome to Watch Mojo. Today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 rip-off songs. Don't believe me, just why? Yes, it's a There's that Fogarty ruling, anything you do from now on, we own it! For this list, we're looking at songs that not only sound similar, they sound so similar it prompted some form of legal action. So what copycat song do you think is the most infamous? Let us know in the comments. Alright, let's check it out. Number 20. The Kinks, All Day and All of the Night versus The Doors, Hello I Love You. Although The Doors guitarist Robbie Krieger denied that his band copied the chord-driven main riff of the 1964 Kinks track, the Kinks music publishers found that these two singles were just a bit too similar. Turns out, UK courts agreed. So a deal was eventually struck, entitling the Kinks to a large share of Hello I Love You's British royalties. The Doors' song credits remain unchanged, but in 2014, Kinks lead singer and main songwriter Ray Davies suggested to Rolling Stone that an out-of-court settlement had been reached. Hello, I love you, me in your game. Number 19, Tom Petty, I Won't Back Down versus Sam Smith, Stay With Me. Traditionally, when songs popped up that sounded a bit Tom Petty, the late Heartbreakers frontman let it slide. But this time, things played out differently. Although the band leader expressed no hard feelings and deemed the similarities between the chorus to his I Won't Back Down and Smith's Stay With Me to be, quote, a musical accident, his publishing company entered the fray all the same. Won't you stay with me? Cause you're all I need. Perhaps it was because, unlike American Girl and Mary Jane's Last Dance, the TP track in question had a co-writer fellow Traveling Wilbury and ELO songwriter Jeff Lynne. In the end, Petty and Lynne ended up getting their due credit, along with 12.5% of the Stay With Me royalties. Number 18, Joe Satriani, If I Could Fly versus Coldplay, Viva La Vida. Take notes on this one, you're gonna need them. It was wicked First up, Brooklyn-based indie alternative band Creaky Board suggested that Coldplay had ripped off their ironically titled The Songs I Didn't Write. However, the British rockers had recorded a demo of Viva prior to that song's first performance. Then, Joe Satriani stepped up, lawsuit in hand, claiming that Chris Martin and crew borrowed from his If I Could Fly. got even more complicated when Yusuf Islam, formerly Cat Stevens, joined in on the fun, pointing out that all of these songs sounded like his Foreigner Suite. Satriani's case was later dismissed in 2009. Number 17, The New Seekers, I'd Like to Teach the World to Sing in Perfect Harmony versus Oasis Shaker Maker. Oasis has never tried to hide their reverence for the past when it comes to their own musical style. But this is one case where Noel Gallagher may have borrowed a bit too much. I'd like to the, world the song I'd Like to Teach the World to Sing in Perfect Harmony began its life as a Coca-Cola jingle, before being fleshed out and recorded by the New Seekers I'd like to teach the world to sing and ultimately having its melody and some lyrics woven into the fabric of Oasis's Shaker Maker. Most sources claim that Gallagher was forced to change the offending I'd like to teach the world line, alter a few notes, and cough up $500,000. Upon losing the aforementioned lawsuit, Gallagher quipped, quote, we drink Pepsi now. Number 16, Muddy Waters' You Need Love versus Led Zeppelin, Whole Lotta Love. By cranking the tempo and volume of the blues, Led Zepp helped pioneer hard rock and heavy metal. Way, way inside, but sometimes they stuck just a bit too close to their roots. Inside, honey, 
while it took them a long time to get caught, the rock icons were finally sued in 1985 for a whole lot of loves, whole lot of similarities to the Willie Dixon penned Muddy Waters classic You Need Love. Baby, way down inside, woman, you need love. Though things were eventually settled out of court, it wasn't the only time the British rockers were accused of borrowing material, as even Stairway to Heaven has been tainted by calls of plagiarism. Number 15. The Rubenews I Wanna Be Your Boyfriend vs. Avril Lavigne Girlfriend hey, hey, you, you, I wanna be your boyfriend. When the Rubenews stepped up claiming Avril Lavigne had plagiarized them, Avril said, Ruben who? But aside from claiming she'd never heard of the band or their song, she and her team chose a risky defense. They said Girlfriend was actually closer to the Rolling Stones' Get Off of My Cloud or Mickey. But wait a minute, what about the Ramones song I Wanna Be Your Boyfriend? Had the Rubenews themselves plagiarized? Ultimately, a musicologist decided the Rubenews track and Avril's song were completely different based on science, and the case was settled out of court when Avril's manager decided it was cheaper than paying lawyers. Number 14. The Kinks' Picture Book vs. The Other Garden Never Got the Chance vs. Green Day Warning. And now, how not to file a lawsuit. In 2001, Colin Mary, songwriter for an obscure English band called The Other Garden, sued Green Day, claiming that Warning was a copy of his song Never Got the Chance. The band's lawyer threatened to sue the punk rockers for as much as $100,000 despite the fact that Mary admitted both his and Green Day's songs had the same distinct riff as Picture Book by the Kinks. Needless to say, the lawsuit was eventually dropped. Number 13. Larrikin Music's Kookaburra vs. Men at Work Down Under Down Under, a backhanded anthem of all things Aussie and a monster hit in the early 1980s, became a source of legal trouble in the 2000s. Originally, the band's flautist, Greg Ham, borrowed a two-bar motif from Kookaburra, an Australian children's song. Years went by without incident, until the connection between the two tunes was mentioned on the game show Spicks and Specs in 2007. That's when the right holders to Kookaburra, Larrikin Music, came knocking, Kookaburra sitting in the old gum tree. demanding 60% of Down Under's royalties dating back to 1981. In July 2010, they instead were granted 5%, backdated to 2002. Sadly, Ham passed away in 2012 at the age of 58, and bandmate Colin Hay cites stress from the court case as a contributing factor. You know, the fact of the matter is that it went unrecognized for 27 years because it was unconscious, it was innocuous, it was naive. Number 12. Huey Lewis in the News, I Want a New Drug versus Ray Parker Jr., Ghostbusters. Who are you gonna call? A lawyer if you're Huey Lewis. Lewis was actually asked to write a theme for Ghostbusters, but passed on it to write music for Back to the Future. So, when Ray Parker Jr.'s theme for the supernatural comedy came out sounding suspiciously like Huey's I Want a New Drug, Lewis cited plagiarism. Something strange in the neighborhood. Who you gonna call? Ghostbusters! It was settled out of court almost a decade later, and when the news frontman spilled the beans on the confidential settlement on TV, Ray Parker Jr. turned the tables and sued Lewis right back in 2001. <laughs> Number 11. Sleigh Bells, Infinity Guitars vs. Demi Lovato, Stars Typically, only lyrics and melody are considered copyrightable. For New York band Sleigh Bells, Demi Lovato's stars sounded, quote, virtually identical to their Infinity guitars, with a little bit of riot rhythm mixed in. But it was chiefly the hand claps and bass drum counter rhythm that were cited. In, we a frenzy. In, we a 
It was on this basis that the duo laid a case against Lovato, UMG Recordings, and producers and co-writers Carl Falk and Rami Yacoub. The problem was, Falk and Yacoub claimed no samples were used in the song, and that Demi only wrote one line. The matter was settled in April 2017, and Lovato's team maintained there was no deliberate infringement. Baby, I'm sorry. Baby, I'm sorry. Number 10. Creedence Clearwater Revival Run Through the Jungle versus John Fogarty, The Old Man Down the Road. In a very odd move, John Fogarty was sued for sounding like himself. You got the voice of speech and riddle. You got the eyes black as coal. Fogarty was once the lead vocalist, lead guitarist, and primary songwriter of Creedence Clearwater Revival. But after the band broke up, he relinquished his rights to CCR songs to get out of contractual commitments. So when Fogarty released the solo track The Old Man Down the Road, Fantasy Records, owner of CCR's song catalog and his label during his Credence days, claimed it ripped off Run Through the Jungle. The Swamp Rocker beat the case by bringing a guitar to the stand and demonstrating that the two songs were, in fact, quite different and that you can't actually plagiarize yourself. Well played, Fogarty. My songs tend to sound like yeah. my songs, right. right? Number 9. Gordon Jenkins' Crescent City Blues versus Johnny Cash' Folsom Prison Blues In the annals of song plagiarism, there have been cases of subconscious plagiarism, outright plagiarism, uncleared samples, and downright sneakiness. This is a case of self-amusement gone awry. While stationed in West Germany in 1953, Johnny Cash wrote new lyrics to the melody of Crescent City Blues, inspired by the film Inside the Walls of Folsom Prison. When I was just a baby, my mama told me son. Flash forward a few years, and Cash is now a recording artist short on material. So he offered up his Folsom Prison Blues to producer Sam Phillips, who told Cash not to worry about the legalities. Oh, I had it coming. I know I can't be free. Fifteen years later, the Men in Black would pay out $75,000 in retribution. Number 8. The Rolling Stones' The Last Time versus The Verve, Bittersweet Symphony This 90s Britpop anthem was at the center of a lengthy and contentious plagiarism case. The Verve did obtain the rights to sample part of the Andrew Oldham orchestral version of the classic Stones song. The issue was how much the band used, and according to former Stones manager and rights holder of the song, Alan Klein, it was way too much. So, 100% of the royalties went to Klein, and songwriting credit went to Mick Jagger and Keith Richards. That's when Oldham himself demanded recompense for the specific version of the song they had used. Though it took many years, this story does have a relatively happy ending, with the Stones backing off by 2019 and granting all future royalties to Verve lead singer Richard Ashcroft. Number 7. Chuck Berry, You Can't Catch Me versus The Beatles Come Together. The story starts simply enough. John Lennon used an old Chuck Berry song as a starting point for a new song. But this similarity triggered legal issues with Berry's publisher, the controversial Morris Levy. As repayment, Lennon agreed to record three songs owned by Levy and attempted to do so during his rock and roll album sessions, until producer Phil Spector stole the tapes and went into hiding. When the tapes were recovered, Lennon tried reassuring Levy that he was upholding his end of the deal by sharing a rough mix of his progress, which Levy released himself and chased with a $42 million breach of contract lawsuit. Lennon, EMI, and Capitol Records countersued, with Levy being awarded a nominal $6,795 while having to pay out somewhere in the ballpark of $150,000. Number 6. The Chiffons' He's So Fine versus George Harrison' My Sweet Lord Soon after releasing his solo hit, the first number one single by a former Beatle, George Harrison found himself at the center of a copyright infringement lawsuit filed by Bright Tunes. Hallelujah. 
Morrison was accused of plagiarizing the Ronnie Mac pen song He's So Fine. The courts ruled that he had subconsciously copied the chiffon smash and would owe nearly $1.6 million in damages. He's a soft-spoken But the story doesn't end there. After Harrison fired his manager, the previously mentioned Alan Klein, during the trial, Klein seized the opportunity to buy the copyright to He's So Fine. Hallelujah. The courts ultimately decided that Harrison would only have to pay Klein's Abco Industries $587,000, and he ended up with the song's rights. Number 5. The Hollies' The Air That I Breathe versus Radiohead, Creep this case is so open and shut, it's almost dull. But I'm a creep. I'm a While writing Creep, Ed O'Brien pointed out to Tom York that the song's bridge had the same chords as the air that I breathe. So York decided to grab the song's melody, too. That song's authors, Albert Hammond and Mike Hazelwood, then sued, but were impressed by the band's honesty and settled for credits and a cut of the Creep royalties. It's a sharp contrast to 2018, when Lana Del Rey would allege that Radiohead's team noticed passing similarities to Creep in her song Get Free and demanded 100% of her royalties. Gone is the of the Number 4. Marvin Gaye, Gotta Give It Up versus Robin Thicke featuring T.I. and Pharrell Williams' Blurred Lines. Let's welcome one of the great talents in the history of popular music. Let's get your hands together, gang, for Mr. Marvin Gaye. In one of many controversies that plagued this summer hit, Robin Thicke actually sued Marvin Gaye's family for alleging the singer had plagiarized the late soul artist. While Thicke admitted he was inspired by Gotta Give It Up, he and co-writer Pharrell Williams contended that despite their similar vibe, they were essentially not the same, citing different chords, keys, and more. Bridgeport Music also became involved due to claims that Blurred Lines sampled Funkadelic's sexy ways. Despite lots of support from music industry heavyweights who did not believe you could copyright a feeling, in 2018, a judge ordered Thicke and Williams to pay nearly $5 million to Marvin Gaye's estate. No more pretending, cause now you winning. Number 3. Chuck Berry, Sweet Little 16 versus The Beach Boys, Surfin' USA. Surfin USA. Here's an instance where the artist openly and knowingly used the tune to an existing song for his new composition. Brian Wilson wanted to write a song about surfing, and felt Chuck Berry's Sweet Little 16 was the perfect setting for his surf-themed lyrics. However, he neglected to credit Berry upon its recording and release. Mommy, Although Surfin' USA was meant to be viewed as a tribute, Barry's publishing company was unimpressed and forced Wilson's manager to surrender copyright to the rock and roll pioneer's publisher, Arc Music. She's got the grown -up blue. Number 2. Multiple Artists vs. Mark Ronson, Uptown Funk Don't believe me, just watch! We guess it takes a village to write a hit song, too. Before the monster hit that is Uptown Funk was even released, Ronson and company offered some credit to Trinidad James. Me, Jay, watch. After it was released, the Gap Band came knocking, claiming similarities to their Oops Upside Your Head, followed by the sequence, collage, and finally Zap in September of 2017. Additionally, Serbian artist Victoria has alleged that the song lifts elements from one of her songs. By 2018, 17% of the track's royalties were transferred to the Gap Band, while the credits have ballooned from Ronson, Bruno Mars, Jeff Basker, and Philip Lawrence to include six additional songwriters from their respective groups. So many interesting stories on this list, in my opinion. As you probably know, Ghostbusters and Back to the Future are two of my most favorite movies, so that is definitely an interesting one for me. But I also really think that the John Fogarty ripping off himself story is very weird. Anyway, 
Our number one pick involves two songs I know we all know, so let's look through some honorable mentions and then we'll name the top copycat song. David Bowie, Boys Keep Swinging versus Blur, M.O.R. Boys keep swinging, boys always work it out, uncage the colors mellow, in one, two, three episodes. Killing Joke 80s versus Nirvana, Come As You Are. Pringle Take a Dive versus Black Eyed Peas I Got a Feeling. I got a feeling that tonight's gonna be a good night. Want more music content? Watch Mojo produces an original podcast taking a behind the scenes look at all things music. The show provides authentic interviews with artists from all around the world, while also staying true to Watch Mojo's roots with top 10 music banter thrown into the mix. What's the best advice Alice Cooper's ever given you? Looking back at the staying power, does it shock you? Uh, no, we have naked pictures of the right people. If you want exclusive interviews with award-winning artists, producers, singers, songwriters, check out Inner Sleeve. Number one. Queen and David Bowie Under Pressure versus Vanilla Ice, Ice Ice Baby. It takes about seven notes to recognize Ice Ice Baby for what it is. While the signature bass line amounts to a sample, Vanilla Ice never sought permission to use it, and instead said his tinkering with the riff and adding one note made it original. But in the face of legal action, the rapper caved and granted David Bowie, as well as all four members of Queen, due credit and royalties. Pressure, pushing down me, pushing down me, no In 2013, Ice claimed to have bought Under Pressure outright. However, the song's publishing info shows that it's co-owned by companies representing Queen, Bowie, and EMI Music, making Ice's claim a bit dubious. After I read this list, I was humming a song and I legitimately could not decide if I was humming Viva La Vida by Coldplay or Joe Satriani or the Creaky Board song. They all sound so similar, I really didn't know. Anyway, be sure to let us know in the comments which song makes you think, hmm, there really are no new ideas anymore. Come tell me on Twitter or Instagram at Rebecca Brayton or come tell me on my YouTube channel. See ya. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.